You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Monday. That means it is Mental Health Monday. Looking forward to our conversation with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman in just a moment. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live uncommon. Good morning, Deaconess Heidi. It is good to chat with you and talk about emotions again today. (laughs) Hey, I'm always excited to talk about emotions and be here with you for Mental Health Monday. Not just emotions, emotions and the gospel, Mm -hmm. understanding our emotions in light of God's word. Mm -hmm. Very helpful resource, great book, enjoying reading it. Today we get to talk about batteries, positive and negative. (laughs) Oh wait, not batteries, emotions, emotions, positive and (laughs) negative. Sorry. Dad joke, I guess. Wow. Um, That really was. I'm glad you called it what it was. Yeah. Uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Gonna represent. Happy Monday. <laughs> Happy Monday, everyone. Positive and negative emotions. All right. So w- this kind of spoke a little too, like hit a little yeah. too close to home, like categorizing everything. Yep. <laughs> Why am I obsessed like everyone else with categorizing everything? Everything has to fit in its place. Everything has to be categorized. Why? Oh, it feels so good satisfying <laughs> I, yes. right it's just so satisfying and the, again just like we talked about last week i think comfort has a lot to do with this it's first of all as humans we want to understand i mean think about the garden of eden right like i want to know like, i want to know i want my my eyes to be opened and, and that's how we were crafted to know but it gets us into trouble and so then when we seek understanding and everything and elevate understanding without keeping that tension with our humanity and with just like being able to be okay with not understanding something or having a space for it or you know like the duckbill platypus doesn't quite fit where it's supposed to go how about we still like the duckbill platypus and think that it's an attribute to nature similarly we we just categorize things so that we feel better about it and i do think it's satisfying it's like oh well i know you know oh i like i can put my check by the list and I can have my nice chart. I mean, I love charts. I am chief of sinners here, right? I just want to categorize to death because it feels very satisfying. Where did this idea come from that some emotions are good and some are bad? Like it's just kind of in our, it's our language that that's just kind of how we talk about them. Do we know, like, where did this come from? Yeah, I recently was having a conversation with someone that I thought was really helpful, actually. I mean, we, again, we are kind of either or black and white thinkers, naturally. And I don't think we were created to be that. But I I honestly believe that that tendency is part of the fall. Like we are limited in, in in our thinking anyway. But I do think there's this place where it becomes an unhealthy pattern for us where we we neglect the things that we don't know. We Mystery is hard for us in a way that mystery wasn't hard for us before the fall. And so I think that comes from the discomfort of A, being human, <laughs> you know, our desire to control. And to, I think there is some control available when we have categories and I can say what is good and what is bad. It especially becomes, it feels like easier to hold in relationships, especially relationships of authority, parenting, teaching, even pastoral, unfortunately. Like we really end up a little bit oversimplifying, like I said, because it feels like a solution. It's a solution to the sin problem. It's a solution, you know, especially when we think about good and evil. Is there good and evil? Absolutely. My husband and I were just talking that good and evil is a lot different than like good and bad or right and wrong. And I think because good and evil, biblically speaking, don't necessarily have neat categories, right? Like, you know, Dr. Jastrom again pointed out to me that God has both love and hate. That's complicated for us, but that can be a really good example for us to understand that we here, especially on earth, have such low understanding of what that is, the good and the bad. So for us to be the labelers of it is a terrible idea, a terrible idea. (laughs) So... I want to get to the list of good and bad, yes. but before we even get to that, Ooh. like what what is it that shapes our perception of an emotion as good mm-hmm. or bad? Like mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. What would make me mm-hmm. think that I, is it a cultural thing? Oh, honestly, I would say mostly it's a family cultural thing. I do uh, think we like to blame most things on the broader culture. And while that has some, you know, work in our lives, honestly, the impact versus our family of origin impact is much more minimal much, much more minimal. Does it have an impact? Absolutely. But I think we we oversell the idea that the entertainment industry or social media or these different things in our lives are the things that teach us. Like that can happen, absolutely. But it's also oversimplified. Our family of origin has the most impact on this. And part of that has to do with values, right? We hand off values. And so we talked about the concept of choosing joy last time. And so if joy is one of those things that I have been taught has high value, then it's pretty easy for that to get twisted into an idea that joy is good and the the opposite or inverse of joy, like, you know, not enjoy. I don't know. What is the inverse of joy? Like misery, I guess. <laughs> so, but that's, again, too simple, right? They're not exact opposites. But, but then misery has zero space. Like melancholy maybe has zero space. And so it, it becomes part of, I think, especially those things that we hold value in, that we teach and we want to hand down that are part of our belief systems. And this is why it becomes so impactful in the church, because we do have emotions attached to our belief system. And we haven't talked about that for years, number one. And number two, we do teach things about emotion and, and we don't realize that we're attaching ideas and beliefs to them. And so it's just very important to, I think, be really honest about that in families and talk about, I mean, just honest conversations in the same way you're going to have honest conversations about suicide and about sex before marriage and about all the things we believe and about who Jesus is. You're going to have conversations about um, what emotions that are very comfortable for us, which ones are uncomfortable. And I think piecing apart. What do we believe about good and bad emotions? It sounds like, Andy, you have had those conversations at your house. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Or maybe I've just had them inside my head. (laughs) Well, I think as a parent of a a semi-young child, you know, not, not incredibly young anymore, but at the same time, we are all learning to be humans, I like to say. And the younger we are as humans, the less we understand about being human. And so we're learning. We're learning what our emotions are, what the names of them are, what we believe about them, how we can interact with them, what the gospel says about them. And so when you are parenting, especially, or or teaching and around children a lot, I think our awareness of emotion is is higher because it's in your face all the time. They Kids don't stuff in the same way we do. They can, and they learn it really fast if they need to in families where the culture is stuffing. But they there are certain emotions that are challenging for us as adults to deal with. The ones especially that are uncomfortable for us is the language I would I would love to pass off <laughs> to the listener, like the the pleasant versus unpleasant ones. These are different for all people. So I think you had mentioned, not to throw into the bus, but excited. So excited is one for people that we would think is very pleasant. Oh, that sounds great. But if you're parenting excited and you're trying to eat dinner and you're trying to get people in the car, like then you know, oh, it's maybe not your favorite at different times. And so people, especially who've had a lot of trauma, I've noticed that sometimes the emotions that some of us would consider to be pleasant are very uncomfortable for them because they're elevated emotions, right? The zones of regulation are really helpful in this. And you can look up that online and it's trademarked by somebody. It's not my program, but I use it a lot. And there's, you know, red, yellow, blue and green emotions, and none of them are right or wrong, but they we experience them differently. And anything that's red in education settings, they teach that it's hard to learn when you're in that red emotion. And so people who have trauma, it is harder. They're, they're more easily activated usually. And so then they either shut down really quickly or they... Um, just have a harder time processing like what's going on and it feels very unpleasant for them. So they kind of want to escape. This is so fascinating. I want to just like go research stuff right now, but (laughs) 
we 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 have teased the, the list of emotions. So, what are some common emotions that are viewed as positive or negative, or good or bad, or right. what was it pleasant and, and unpleasant? I well, like that language. so I think that yeah, pleasant and unpleasant, comfortable, uncomfortable is the preferential way to maybe consider it so that now that's not maybe ideal for everyone. It's just my suggestion that that gets us off of this positive negative idea. I think therapeutically that's worked that I've seen it work, even though this is not therapy. I do offer in the book on page 46, what I notice both for myself or maybe around me, things that we tend to label as positive and things we tend to label as negative. Again, I I do encourage someone in the book to make their own list because before you get too wrapped up in what the culture thinks or the people around you think, it's really insightful to be connected to ourselves, to sit before God and be like, huh, what do I think of sadness? Do I see that as positive? Because there's a lot of people out there that you would be surprised that are at the place where they can honestly say, you know, I don't think that bothers me as much as other people or whatever. So page 46, positive. I think we are more comfortable, if you will, with happy, joyful, laughing, excited, relaxed, content, and calm. I would say those last two, content and calm, can get real messy in the church too. Or peaceful is maybe another one. Unified. So some emotions are what we call like I consider to be emotion adjacent because there's probably more concrete truth to some of them and we experience them outside of ourselves to some degree. Like we talked the capital J joy of Jesus, but we also experience a sense of it. And so when I talk about those kind of things that you hear as like almost quote unquote more biblical emotions, which is not a thing. But when we hear it like that because of our cultural constructs, then it's important to understand that we understand that there might be something distinct and concrete about it, objective from us and God, but that we experience as subjective in a sense of it. So, and then the negative, and then I'll stop talking for a minute, sad, angry, hurt, opinionated, jealous, irritated, and shameful. Those are just a few examples, but those are what I have noticed around me especially. seem like people struggle with more categorizing in positive or negative. Or just noon to 5 p.m. That's so funny. I would guess 4 to 5 p.m. That's like the worst. (laughs) (laughs) It is Mental Health Monday. We're talking about emotions and the gospel today with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman. We have more to chat about in just a moment. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Mental Health Monday with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman taking a look at emotions in the gospel. Today we're talking positive and negative emotions, not batteries. (laughs) Sorry, dads. I thought it was all about batteries today. We are not talking about batteries or electricity at all. We're just talking about emotions. So we went through a list of commonly categorized as positive or pleasant and commonly categorized as negative or unpleasant. See, I'd rather just stick with positive and negative or good and bad, but I guess pleasant and unpleasant (laughs) is fine too. Well, I'm glad you said that. I think they're, I mean, understand, and I say this in the book a lot, so I should say this here, is that the research is really divided on this. Like, this is one area of emotion where at least social psychologists and, and the like have a very hard time deciding what kind of language and whether it serves us well to to label them in that way. The The list of unpleasant or negative. <laughs> I think we just need to, we need to reevaluate the role of negative mm-hmm. or un- 
unpleasant unpleasant. emotions. Yes, Uh unpleasant. Because they have value, do Uh they not? Yeah. Yeah, What's what what do they how do they serve us? Well, one of the things I find myself saying in almost every presentation I've ever given is, can you imagine a broken world without the ability to shed tears over it? Like I I just can't. I don't think I want to. How would we release the heaviness of the world without the emotion of sadness or even loneliness? We remember emotions are information. They're informants, not leaders. Without that information, without me knowing, I feel lonely. How do I turn toward connection? as a human being. I think that's really important. And I say that because those two in particular really stand out to me that we need them. Same thing with anger, even rage. How do I confront injustice without the ability to have that part of me pricked by the injustice and a sense inside of me well up that something needs to be done. I I don't think that would be good for us. Even apathy, you know, I think about people talk about apathy, complacency, especially in the church today. And while those are problematic, sometimes people need to check out. (laughs) Like, you know, sometimes we need to care a little less. And sometimes I think there is a season where we have to go a little apathetic or complacent about specific things in our life, like a coworker or a certain thing. And so I I do think there's many, many of these emotions that serve us extremely well in a broken world. And there's some mystery to how we experience some emotions in a, in a world that won't be broken, right? Someday when Jesus comes back. Mm-hmm. Isn't, isn't there some neuroscience, this might be getting in the weeds, but isn't there some neuroscience on like how tears and and like crying in different situations they're actually like chemically different because that is what your body actually needs to be releasing in that moment like that Uh, that is just a a wild thing that our bodies are are, they're literally created to like Mm -hmm. feel and process emotions and if we ignore them that that doesn't end well no you're right you're absolutely right i know the research on this and as we get more and more into neuroscience research it's fascinating it's amazing and the reality is it's just like an exercise and i think andy can probably speak better to this than i can but that our body releases toxins right it releases all these proteins we get trapped up in our muscles and it helps keep things lotioned up if you will in our joints and stuff like that it releases those toxins to become waste in our uh, digestive streams and everything and to be released in our sweat and things like that. The same thing we know happens through other methods in processing the different things of life. Our body has ways. We've been programmed by God with ways to release those things that get stuck up inside of us. And so that is such a cool part about processing emotions, which we get into in this section three in the book. And so there's a a little geeky neuroscience there for you, Sarah. Yes, I'm I'm stoked for that. I love like, well, one of my many things that I love. Neuroscience is just awesome. There is <laughs> there is a sentence in this book, in this chapter, that I, I underlined and I wrote next to it and I started it. So emotions are anything but simple. This partial truth becomes more dangerous for Christians when we equate emotions our culture considers negative with sin. Can we yeah. just unpack that a minute? Because I think that can be and has been very damaging to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Emotions aren't sin in themselves. <laughs> they they simply aren't. God is emotional. And I think that's one reason the book is subtitled Created for Connection, because there is some objectivity to this, right? Like outside of my subjective emotional experience, there is some objectivity because God experiences emotion. And I think it's important that... Um, especially emotions like sadness or anxiety, these different things that God actually biblically gives us some ways to confront, to navigate, if you will, but they certainly always turn us to him. And instead, what happens when we equate them with sin, people hear that um, as the need to turn away from God or that God is turning his face away from us in our sin. You know, we couple that with theology that God can't stand sin. And even that is like really complicated, right? And and maybe oversimplified in theology because we have Jesus Christ and he redeems and restores and our relationship with God is intact no matter what we do. It is not dependent. However, because our faith is related to attachment and our attachment to God, sometimes it is harder to 
sense his presence. And when we we coat on this idea that people are certain behaviors are sinful, certain emotions are then equated with behaviors that are sinful. As human beings, we take the weight of that. It weighs us down with shame and we are we we turn away from God or we maybe put our heads down and aren't able to see God working and reaching out to us in the same way. He's always there, but I do think we have to be aware of the way that our words and what we teach people weighs them down heavy enough to make God less clear for them and his gospel less clear for them. I think there's a responsibility that, you know, Tim- the books of Timothy and things talk about when we teach about things. When we categorize as positive or negative or pleasant, unpleasant, good, bad, ugly, whatever they might be, when we categorize or judge emotions, Mm -hmm. how does that impact then how we manage our emotions? (laughs) Well, that's just the thing. I think it does twist our vision of God. And that's really, at the end of the day, the point (laughs) that to Sarah's question even is it really just distorts how we see God and his approachability, if you will, his desire to reach into our lives. And so we see God as as judgment oriented. I was just reading somewhere, and forgive me, my quote is not going to be exactly right. I don't have it in front of me, but that about 73% of the population universally churched and unchurched see God from a fear or anger orientation, like toward them, that they see God as someone to be afraid of, or that is angry at us, that does not receive our anxieties, that does not want our sadness. Oh my goodness. Oh world. (laughs) Like, just want to hug you all. Like, I want you to know that that's not who God is. And so if we see God from that heavy judgment with no grace, no mercy, no no redemption available, that is going to impact then how we see ourselves, which is really the point of this book, right? (laughs) Is that uh, my sense of self is heavily dependent on that you know divine connection in how i experience emotions and vice versa my divine connection is impact on how i see myself and so we do start to over manage ourselves because we think god is a manager we think that that's his goal is to make me a better person when his goal is relationship with me and growth and bringing me to the place of restoration when Jesus comes back to spend eternity together in that relationship. God does not manage us. God restores. And I I think a lot of people in our current culture especially experience God as a manager. And that's one thing that's keeping them from the gospel and from the church. And so if there's any way that we can do work within our own emotions and the emotions of those around us together in connection, then the gospel can be clearer for them too. Their attachment to God can be repaired and healed. So what do we what do we do with all of this now that we're like throwing all these emotions around and and thinking about them, thinking through them? How do we process through them? How do we look at them differently? Maybe if we've had these hard categories in our head of, of what's good and what's bad, mm-hmm. how do we maybe take a step back and and rethink how we think about our own emotions and the, and the emotions in our like families of origin? Oh, absolutely. So I did create a little bit of a resource for this at the back of the book is that emotion word list. And I really like lists because they're more open than like the wheel where it's categorized, even though I use a wheel all the time. So no judgment. Sometimes the wheel helps when you're trying to discern granularity, we call it, which is get from anger to like what is frustration or irritation or like, you know, understand kind of the way things fit together. But the emotion word list is a little more open in its availability, especially if all we're trying to do is repair it and come before God in our emotion and understand them better. And so you can look at that emotion word list. It's, it starts on page 172. You can look at the intention, how it was formulated and stuff. But to sit in, in these emotion words that we find in the English translations of scripture in particular, because 
the Greek and Hebrews, that could chase us down a whole nother rabbit hole if I open up a list of that. It helps us just to sit with those emotions before God instead of them being categorized, to just discover and to bring them before God and to sit with him and, and be in rest and refuge with him about the emotion, let him help us process them and to grow. And so it's like a very growth oriented exercise instead of we just so easily get caught in the weeds of that managing ourselves when we deal with our emotions as they come up. And there's, we'll get to that. We'll find ways to process. But I think if we're going to process the way we come at emotions as a whole, that emotion word list is a good place to start to rest in the arms of the God who loves us in Jesus Christ. Also a helpful tool for helping your child develop mm. emotional vocabulary as well. Because mm. maybe you're an adult learning these terms alongside your child. <laughs> you were talking about parenting earlier. <laughs> it's not, true. Not, it's not, fun. Right. It's, it's good. Also, you exactly. it's I mean, you can sound cool. Like instead of saying I'm tired, you can be like, I'm weary. Right. I mean, like, I just <laughs> love that there's so much vocabulary available to us in scripture. And some of them, like, my bones are wasting. Wow. That says a lot more <laughs> than, you know, I'm sad or I'm tired. But it is really quite entertaining to hear a four year old say that. Mm. Yep. I feel like this should be a thing. I want to hear more of that yes. in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mental Health Monday, Emotions and the Gospel with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman. Thanks so much, Heidi. Have a great week. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Anywhere.